Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Um, we're just going to give it one more minute and then we will get started. Okay. I hope everybody is well. Um, and um, it's supposed to be spring, but it's been chilly here. It definitely was chilly and windy on the island today. So. <laughs> but sunny, so, and lots of things in bloom. So we hope you'll come out and visit us. Um, I just, again, wanna say good evening and we're so glad that everybody's able to join us this evening. We've really been looking forward uh, to this meeting because we have a wonderful guest this evening. Um, and we're really grateful that you're all here as well as that Amy has been able to join us. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Amy Nazuma Matadal is the author of World of Wonders, a New York Times bestseller, and the 2020 Barnes and Noble Book of the Year, as well as uh, the author of four poetry books, including most recently Oceanic, the winner of the Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters Award. Other awards for her writing include fellowships and grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, National Endowment of the Arts, Mississippi Arts Council and the McDowell. Her writing appear in Poetry, The New York Times Magazine, ESPN and Tin House. She serves as poetry faculty for the writing workshop in Greece and is a professor of English and creative writing in the Missis University of Mississippi's MFA program. So we are thrilled, Amy, thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, Elizabeth Howard is joining us as well to um, start off the conversation with the two of them. So I will turn it over to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. And this is actually our last Zoom reading program. Uh, I hope I hope all of you turn your computers off this summer and and you know go to Randall's Island when it's really beautiful. <laughs> and we'll be out. We we do have a few things planned, but they'll all be in the park. So we'll we'll start with Zoom again when maybe in the fall when when the temperature changes. Um, Amy, it really is wonderful to have you with us today. Particularly, I was so pleased when Claire called and said, Amy can be there on April 22nd because this of course is the 51st anniversary of Earth Day. Yeah. I posted a photograph on Instagram early this morning of Mayor John Lindsay standing in front of the New York Public Library between the two lions, Patience and Fortitude, mm -hmm. at that very first, 1970, um, mm -hmm. very first Earth Day. Fifth Avenue was closed, the sky was bright blue, and it, uh, Fifth Avenue was closed from Central Park to Union Square, and then 14th Street from river to river was also closed and was sort of, uh, there was an ecological street fair. Mm. I think then we felt uh, that we understood the fragility of nature and we needed perhaps patience. I think now we need fortitude. Mm. <laughs> I think we're getting over a little bit of, of the patience. Um, so it's so wonderful to have you here on, on this day and I know in your um, in World of Wonders, in the in your essay on southern cassowary, the bird in Australia, you end it by saying uh, this bird is dying because humans aren't paying attention. But we're all connected. Boom. So I thought maybe you could tell us your reflections on Earth Day. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, to Randall Islands. Um literary program here. It's it's such a joy to to be here. One of the one of the few joys of the pandemic is being able to travel, even I say more so than in the before times. You know, this, just this morning I was in I would have been in Nevada. And um earlier, even before that, I was in Barnes and Noble headquarters in New York City. So and I've never left this chair, you know, um, and I'm here in Oxford, Mississippi. So uh good for the planet in that way. Too. So I'm, I'm so excited to kind of finish off your season here um, at the book club. Um, you know, I think it's uh, reflections on Earth Day. I think that uh, I continue to be ha uh, heartened by the movement. I think um, it's it still has a long way to go, but I think I'm so heartened to see that the people who are um, most visible um, uh, 
participating in different events or um, just being able to be outside represents a little bit more what the earth looks like. You know, um, I know as a child in the 80s and, and early 90s, uh, I saw very distinctive um, groups celebrating Earth Day um, and they were primarily, you know, white upper upper middle class kids, you know, and I, I'm heartened to see that people of um, all different economic backgrounds, different abilities um, are out there, maybe a little bit less so because we're in a pandemic, but uh, I'm so glad to see that leaders have um, been more embracing of diversity of all different kinds of diversity to represent, you know, more, um, more of what this planet looks like. So it's, it's, an ex it's exciting to be a part of it. It's exciting to do this um, as a parent of half white children um, so that they see that this is not just for a certain group, but this is for all of humanity. You know, this is for, and not just humanity, it's for creatures and plants as well. So yeah, I'm, heart I'm heartened to see that it, there's more accessibility um, more than ever before. So we've loved reading World of Wonders and um, in praise of fireflies, whale sharks and other astonishments. How did you come up with the title? I love the title, Amy. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. It was really hard because, you know, on the one hand, I wanted there to be something besides World of Wonders. And I went through a whole gamut of, um, of titles, but really what it came down to, I kept coming back to that word astonishment. Um, and, you know, it goes back to um, a quote from Mary Oliver that I now put um, on the top of all of my syllabi. Uh, I'm a professor here, here at um, University of Mississippi and I teach poetry, but I also teach environmental literature and nature writing. And it says, there's three rules um, Mary Oliver says for her life is pay attention. Number two, be astonished. And then three, tell about it. And it's that, be astonished that I kind of love so much, letting yourself be astonished um, in a world that wants you to be jaded and not, and, and kind of nonplussed, you know? I think you don't have to tell kids, for example, to be astonished, you know? I spend time with anybody under seven and one of the words that they say all the time is, look, mom, look at the moon, look at this, look, look. Even when I was single and thought I had, I did not want kids, I was not gonna get married. You know, I lived next door to this house full of kids. I would hear through the windows, just look, watch, look, look. I mean, so I think something happens though around junior high, those middle school years where it's suddenly, for some people, it suddenly becomes not cool to be astonished or to, to exclaim over the moon or a flower, you know? I could see um, my eldest is now 13, but when he was four and in preschool, the one time his whole you know, schooling career <laughs> has ever been in trouble is because, because he called someone stupid face. Um, and I write about this. I write about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he only said that because someone told him that only girls can like butterflies, like monarch butterflies. So it starts so young and here I thought, so I was kind of proud that he, you know, I, I talked to him like maybe we shouldn't use words like that, but I was also <laughs> proud that he was able to recognize like, no boys can like butterflies, you know, that kind of thing too. So um, he's, you know, he's entering teenage years and I'm hoping, hoping, and he's been home, you know, over a year now, but I'm hoping that when he returns back to school, he still has that wonderment, still is able to maybe not say stupid face to somebody, you know, but isn't, is just unabashed in their, in his declarations of what amazes him, what delights him, what astonishes him, um, going back to Mary Oliver's words. So that's really kind of, that was a center, central tenet that I wanted to um, use in the title is, is astonishment. I wanted to kind of remind us all again, you know, that as kids, everybody's astonished. They let themselves be astonished. Um, yeah, we all have to be astonished. Uh, yeah, yeah, and some of us never lose that. So I wanna also give that, you know, um, but some of us maybe have forgotten a little bit, you know. Um, but not only is it the 
anniversary of our Earth Day, 51st anniversary. It's also the 25th anniversary of National Poetry Month. Yes. But you are a poet and you have four published books of poetry. And so last week we had a program. We had 21 poets who read their poetry oh. and it's called Poets Reading Poetry. Um, and I wondered if you would read us a poem or two and sure. share something with us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at core, my heart is always going to be in poetry. Um, and actually, my graduate degrees are actually in poetry and creative nonfiction. Um, there's just something that I love about the compression of poetry, the precision of language. And, you know, you could have that in essays as well. Um, but there's something about the tension of the line break, the dance that happens like uh, when you get to the end of a line, where do you break it? You know, that kind of thing. Um, I still love that. That's That's been, that's always gonna be central. You know, a lot of times people say like, oh, you're giving up on poetry. No, I'm not giving up on poetry. I just, I switched for one book. Give me a break, give me a break. I'm hoping to have a long, long life. I'm in it for the long haul. Um, so poetry is always my first love. Uh, I wanna read a, a poem from my book, Oceanic. Uh, which came out in 2018 from Copper Canyon. And um, when I, I read this, this poem um, uh, last week, and it sounds a little bit bonkers, but hopefully people here in the audience know, I was talking about a documentary about penguins narrated by Morgan Freeman. Do you know this, Elizabeth? No. Um, it's um, March of the Penguins. Does that sound familiar? It won Oscars. Yes, I guess. I guess. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was not that long ago because we see it at least maybe once every other month here in the house. Someone in the chat reminded me, no, Amy, it wasn't around um, since 20, 2005 is when it was made. Okay, I was going to say, it, it, it has been. Yeah. It's been a while. I didn't realize it. And then some people, when I told the high school students, they just thought I was bonkers. Morgan Freeman narrated <laughs> Penguins? Like what? I was like, I promise, I promise it's, it's a, a thing. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, um, you can Google it. It's nice ambient. There's lots of drama, suspense, danger. I, trust me when I say that you'll be amazed at how much it's like a soap opera watching the soap right. opera of penguins. Anyway, I wrote this poem during a time when uh, my husband and I were dealing with um, oh, uh, you know, he's an English professor as well. We were teaching full time and we had two kids under three. And we lived in Western New York for about 15 years. So winters in Western New York were just, you know, I don't have to tell most many of you this. It's just, you know, I, mean, I remember turning in final grades in May in my full on winter gear, you know. Um, anyway, so this was just kind of, uh, this is a Valentine uh, when I didn't think either, it sounds so funny now to me, but at the time I, honestly did not know when we would ever get a full night of sleep ever again. It seemed impossible. So um, this was inspired by March of the Penguins. This is Penguin Valentine. Praise the patience of a Papa Penguin. I don't envy those dark starlit nights with only the occasional blush green current of auroras across his claws. See how sweetly he holds the egg close in his brood pouch? I am certain his fierce tenderness would scare even a crab eater seal five times his size. What exactly does the Papa Penguin register in a nighttime that lasts two whole months? During those days of no sun, does he remember the particular bend of his mate's neck, that hint of yellow near her ears? Or does he hunger for a slip of hooked squid? Worry the grand gulp of air he must take, the concentration needed to slow down his heart. Praise the faithfulness, the resolve, the lanceolate feathers shaped like tiny spears, perfect to poke through a cartoon heart and signal Valentine. And Valentine, I sing your praises, not because I know you'll wait for me like that, though I know you would if you could, but because you never waver. I don't know how you know what direction to look and how to listen for my return. 
even when my call boils from the floor of the darkest of Arctic seas, even if for now, all we can feel is a cast of red crabs stretching before our path. Oh, that's beautiful, Amy. That's really lovely. And place is, it plays such a role in, in your book since you move so often. And I, I was so envious, but you seem very happy in Oxford, Mississippi. And I, I was so envious. I made a pilgrimage to Oxford just a couple of years ago because oh, well, I'd always wanted to see Rowan Oak. I'd mm -hmm. always, I, you know, William Faulkner is one of my favorite American authors. And I loved walking through into his writing room with, you know, a book drafted on the walls and, and just yes. you know, wonderful place and the bookstore it's you know walking through the campus you write about it in red spotted newt mm -hmm. uh, about just feeling feeling a sense of home when you when you arrive there yeah you know um what year were you here uh, did you make that trip through through oxford about three years two or three years ago oh okay yes you know sadly i have to say um i and this this is on me i have to admit when I first got the um, the call, it's this miraculous call, you don't uh, apply for it. You just, I was selected by the, the wonderful um, colleagues here at University of Mississippi to be the John Grisham writer in residence. So that's what called me here to Mississippi. I was tenured, I was teaching at a SUNY school. Um, my husband was tenured and I thought, well, it's nine months. This will be our like Southern Europe, you know, um, National Lampoon's vacation. Kind of just, we'll bring the whole family. We'll bring the dog named Haiku. Um, we'll just see what it's like living in the South for nine months. And it is, it's, it's like what you mentioned. I felt like magnets snapping at attention. Um, something clicked. I love the heat after being in cold, you know, but south of Buffalo, New York for 15 years. I love that we moved on a hundred degree day here, but there was something about the heat and being in such a literary town. When I say literary, you can pass me up, Elizabeth, not only Rowan Oak, but Mississippi has the, um, the, the most number of, is it, um, it's, um, I should get this right, uh, Pulitzers and National Book Award winners. Um, yeah. And uh, I mean, we just have such a, a amazing, vibrant literary history in the state. Uh, my only experience with it, sadly, is from TV shows. And I just assumed this was not a good place for a woman of color, you know. Um, and ironically, the thing is, is no matter all my travels around the world, and that's from, you know, I went to a nice suburban high school in Ohio. I uh, spent my elementary school years in um, Phoenix. Um, Mississippi, ironically, is the one place that I don't get questioned about what am I or, um, or, or be told, go back to where you came from, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, and I think it's because people here have had to deal head on, not just polite little whispers, but head on with questions of race from a very early age. You know, my um, one of my youngest son's first field trips ever, and I was a chaperone on this field trip, was to the Lorraine Museum, which is about an hour away. Or uh, the, the Lorraine, it's a museum now, but it's um, the Lorraine Hotel. And those of you who don't know, that's where Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And so I thought, oh, well, they'll do the second grade version of this tour. But no, they brought out all these seven-year-olds onto the balcony and, you know, they pointed out, look, this is across the street. That's where the bad man with a rifle shot and killed Martin Luther King. And, I, you know, the kids were understandably terrified and um, flummoxed how anyone would want to hate a person so much or be scared of a person so much just based on the color of their skin. So... I feel like I, it, Mississippi is not perfect by any means. Um, and sometimes it feels like they're moving at a snail's pace with um, being progressive. But I think there is a large number of people who um, really want to move forward and to really try and reconcile, not ignore it, but it reconcile the, the hate and the hurts from the past and to and to do so by educating people of all mm -hmm. backgrounds. So the kids that when I go into schools in the before times 
it's so heartening to see, you know, um, people of all different backgrounds, Muslims, um, sons of millionaires, daughters of people who need um, governmental assistance, people in rural areas, people um, kind of right here in town come together and they're friends. They hang around, they're sitting together at the cafeteria. There's not the kind of the cliques of jocks and st- that's what I grew up with, you know, and I always stood out like a sore thumb, but my kids here, um, I married a white guy from Kansas, uh, but they have kid, uh, friends who are Latino, um, Muslim, Vietnamese, um, sons of good old boys, you know, that kind of thing. And all the, and they're so happy. They're so happy here. And they're um, nice. not just tolerated, they're embraced. People embrace difference. Again, it's not perfect, but that's been my experience um, here in North Mississippi. And if you were to tell me this five years ago, you know, I m- might have been scared if, if you said like, oh, you're going to be living in Mississippi now, you know, um, just based on what you see in movies and how it's Mississippi is represented. It makes you think that nobody here reads. And it's actually the opposite, as you know, you know, the, the main entertainment of our town is a bookstore. And right. I, that's such a wonder. What's the type? What's the name of the bookstore? It's called Square Books. And that is, you know, I mean, we'd get all these big names coming through on their southern tours. And then afterwards, if you were so inclined, you know, people would uh, go to a city grocery for a cocktail or a plate of french fries and get to chat with these big names um coming through and that's that was that and football are the two main kind of sources of entertainment and i love it i'm i love college football so this is kind of in some ways that the home that i never knew i would find here in of all places mississippi now, because there are such beautiful illustrations in this book, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about who is the illustrator. I mean, they're just, they're wonderful. Yeah, you know, um, well, so going back, thank you so much. In, in this book, I'll show an example. Here's, um, here's the vampire squid, one of my favorite cephalopods. And if you don't have a favorite cephalopod, you need to fix your life and figure one out. Um, this one's my, my, I just, I just adore him so much. And um, this is, kind of an inspiration. Um, here's just something like the firefly. I was very purposeful in choosing plants and animals that some people would know, like a firefly or a monarch butterfly. And then some like the cassowary or the narwhal maybe that people have never seen in person. You know, I wanted to showcase that you don't have to have had one as a pet in order to care about it. That you can actually care about plants and animals and people on the other side of this planet that you've never seen before or had interaction with, but because you get to know about them, you get to read about them. So that was really important to me, but it's an homage. The illustrator here is Fumi Nakamura. And it was important for me to have an Asian American illustrator simply because as a child in the seventies and eighties, all the nature books that I loved so much, I would sit for hours on the floor of our local libraries and just, read about volcanoes or dinosaurs or the names of shells, um, um, any kind of explorers in the outdoors, John Muir, Annie Dillard, Terry Tempest Williams. I loved all those books, but I never saw anybody that looked like me outdoors. So that coupled with books uh, or with, um, with movies, TV shows, I just simply didn't see Asian Americans outdoors ever, which is, it's so wild, right? You know, I mean, my sons have grown up with characters um, like Dora the Explorer, which is a cartoon, a Latinx um, uh, outdoor explorer who seems to be alone in a jungle, but she's out there, you know. Uh, I just, I didn't have the vocabulary for it, but it made it seem like Asian Americans never go outside (laughs) or they never smile if they are depicted outside, you know? So I wanted to showcase, um, so for the illustrations, that's kind of an homage to the, that kind of old school um, 60s and 70s um, design where there was maybe one color um, of the illustrations, but I wanted to have like a small little bit of whimsy so you would get an extra little smile in something like the whale shark. I still wanted it to be biologically accurate but I wanted there to be a little bit of whimsy. We have my favorite amphibian, the um, axolotl, 
which has kind of, it looks like it's the smile. That's just how its mouth curves up. If I can find the page here. And I, and the illustrator Fumi had it clutching a little, it almost looks like it's holding a bouquet of flowers. And that's not something axolotls do necessarily, but I just love the idea of it. Let me see, oh, I'm missing it now. Well, here's something called the potu, which is a nocturnal bird with a bright, it almost looks like a traffic light eye. So I, I loved that homage to the books because I didn't want to, you know, I learned so much from those books. So I'm not at all saying that I didn't like my predecessors, but those are the classics. I, I owe so much to them, but I wanted to embrace, I wanted to see if there was room for the, at the table for people who looked like me. Um, but also this book was absolutely not meant just for Asian Americans. This is just to show that there are other people who love the outdoors, who love makeup, who love 80s pop music, and who also love the outdoors. Not just you had to choose one or the other, or, oh, you can't be a mother and a present mother or a present partner and still love the outdoors. You know, I, mean, I, I didn't see a whole lot of books that had that. Had, as Will Whitman says, do I contain multitudes? Very well, I contain multitudes. I wanted to not be able to, I, I wanted to showcase that, yes, you can have a family. Yes, you can love your job. Yes, you can love your husband. Um, and you can also love, you know, pop culture and the outdoors. You don't have to choose one or the other, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And, it, you know, I, I just love having Mizuka Matato Nakamura on a book of nature. You know, I just, I, I just simply, you know, I know that there was out, people out there. I'm not doing anything new, but I point my fingers back to publishers and to, um, teachers who were not teaching, and, and at least in my case, who were not teaching anybody but 60 years old and up um, white folks, white nature writers. And again, I'm not knocking them at all because I learned those are the classics for me. It just would have been amazing to see, oh, I would have loved to have read Terry Tempest Williams as a teen, or I would have loved to have read um, Robin Wall Kimmer as a teen, you know? Um, any black woman that would have been amazing you know you would make it, it they made it seem like they just didn't exist and i know that's not the case now so and to publishers i would just say i'm hoping that this opens up again more space and more conversation that our nature writing should reflect more of this country's population you know um, and my white husband from kansas would be the first to say that that he was diminished by not reading books from people of different backgrounds than him. Um, when he was a, a, a book loving, baseball loving boy in, in the oil fields in Western Kansas, you know, um, he had kind of the same education as, uh, as me where we were only taught nature writers were above 60 and white and straight. Well, it, it, yeah, so that we could go on for a long time about that, um, Amy and I. So I, we had because your book is so creative. I mean, it just you know it because you it's it's drawing and it's thinking about colors and shapes and things. So one of our programs, we invited an artist, Rebecca Allen, and we had nature drawing. Oh, fantastic! And so it, it, it and so just as in a writing class, you would have a prompt. Right, you know, I thought, well, we need a we need a prompt in, you know, to start the drawing. Mm -hmm. So I read from the Peacock chapter, oh. and, and I didn't read all of it. And for those of you, the people here probably don't know that chapter, or weren't on that call. Um, well, Amy probably could tell it better, but she was a, a student, and the teacher gave them an assignment to draw something, and she started drawing a peacock. Which I'll let you finish it, but I have to say, Amy. So I was going to read this out loud, um, you know, to this group before we did. I literally had to read it out loud that afternoon about four times before I could read it without tears just welling in my eyes. I thought I can't, and and that 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 ending when you talk about, um, I mean, it just it was so astonishing to me 
that a teacher would ever do that. You know, we have peacocks in New York. We have peacocks yeah. in the cathedral. You know, there's four peacocks at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. And in the way you ended it, you know, my favorite color is peacock blue. My favorite color is peacock blue. But maybe you could talk a little bit about that chapter and tell people what sort of what happened. I mean, it was quite astonishing. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, thank you so much for um, reading so closely. And um, I, I, lo I love that that chapter has resonated with so many people, so many white people in particular. And that it means so much to me because I feel like, you know, and that's just one tiny little story. It's not representative of my, of my whole childhood at all. For however many moments like that, there was 10 times more moments of joy and feelings of love. And I, and for that, I feel so grateful, but I think a lot of times one of the one of the, you know, every time I do an event, there's always, you know, what I call bird splainers, someone who is an ornithologist who tells me that's not an, that's not how cardinals speak or something, you know, um, they try to tell me that my bird calling is not correct. And I'm, and I'm like, I don't know what to tell you because I can make these sounds and cardinals will literally fly to my, my backyard and I have witnesses. But, um, so I call that bird splaining, <laughs> you know, like, um, one of the things that these bird splainers often have in common is that sentence, which always kind of just makes me laugh a little bit. It's like, why do you, I thought this was gonna be a book about nature. Why do you have to make it about race? Um, and the thing of it is, is like, so that happened, that story that you mentioned, the gist of it is, is there was a drawing contest in third grade. Um, we were just told to draw an animal, one of our favorite animals, that's it. That was the instructions. Everybody chose like kind of household pets. I, I had just come from visiting my grandparents in India for the first time. I had never met them before. So everything India was so dazzling to me and uh, peacocks were all over the place there, um, especially in my, in my grandparents' backyard. Uh, and so of course, as a eight-year-old girl, I just, uh, I was so excited to draw a peacock. Um, in the middle, I, I mean, just kind of, it was so weird to me because I'm an A student. I'm used to being teacher's pet, but this teacher really kind of, I don't, I have, I still have no idea what happened, but suddenly stood over me. And in this very like demonstrative way, she could have whispered or something. Uh, if I misunderstood the assignment or something, she's like, this is, you know, basically the gist of it is she said, this is unacceptable. We need to only choose American animals. And then she was like glaring at me. And I kind of was doing my, axolotl smile my little you know kind of uncomfortable I just didn't you know she never said we need to do American animals and I knew that I'd seen them in San Diego in Miami during visits road trips there um so I didn't understand and she like punished me by staying like again it's not a it's not huge in hindsight but she pulled, called me out in front of the entire class kept me in after recess like I didn't get a recess, I had to do over my the entire project. And I was terrified and mortified um, because she made such this such a big demonstrative example of this. And that was the first time, it was so strange to me. I don't, you know, again, maybe I'm not a psychologist, maybe that coupled with the fact that I saw no books with anybody looking like me, nothing on TV, um, I was mortified. And so for the longest time, I was like, well, for, you know, I, I, I did end up winning the contest because I drew kind of my little sassy self there, drew an American bald eagle. Cause I was like, you want an American animal? That's the most ridiculous American, not ridiculous, the most obnoxiously American animal I can think of. And I put a American flag in the drawing. <laughs> so that's my, I think that was my little eight-year-old passive aggressive way of like saying, is this American enough for you? Uh, I won for the whole school, but what that taught me as an eight-year-old is to not celebrate my heritage, not, uh, it, it just didn't give me confidence to, to be different, sadly, you know, I, I, that's great if you were encouraged, if that never happened to you, if differences were encouraged in your class, that just simply wasn't the case for me, and uh, not in suburban uh Phoenix, Arizona, where I was the only Asian American in my class, 
in a in a mostly white school um and where i saw you know people telling my doctor mother you know um at the checkout line speak english i can't understand your english you know even though she was speaking english you know and i i didn't have the vocabulary for it but as an eight-year-old girl you notice these things i my mother is so articulate so elegant so smart and that's the one time i ever saw her freeze up and like almost be shamed you know so it, it was for the longest time i just i asked my dad like let's get rid of you know my house had all these peacock paintings and figurines um and I, and I just was mortified. I'm embarrassed now that I was embarrassed then, but for a good portion of my childhood, you know, you had well-meaning friends who would say, yuck, what are you eating? And it would be like noodles, pancit, you know, uh, a beautiful dish from the Philippines, or here's lumpia, or here's a, a special fish curry from India, South India. Again, maybe it's hard for some people to understand this, but in the eighties, anything different was so considered weird or not great, uh, questioning your, you know, whether or not you belong. So uh, obviously I'm past it now. And now it's like, I roll my eyes a little bit. Some of these same friends that I'm still friends with now are like, oh, Amy, let's go grab sushi or whatever, or let's go get Thai food. Now it's completely socially acceptable, but it wasn't for a girl in 1979 to bring, I was so proud of it, a meal in my lunchbox, carefully lovingly crafted by my parents but it was you know it was noodles or a curry dish with rice you know that kind of thing so anyway all this to say is this is not just an asian american thing i think everybody as a as a teen at some point feels out of place at some point so i think that's what's kind of touching upon people and i really that's that's one essay for this but i really wanted this to be um, a celebration of what brings me joy. Now, I mean, um, I have so many, I have so many, I'm looking here at my bookshelves. I have so many peacock figurines. My favorite color is peacock blue. Um, but I would be remiss if I just kind of skipped over those years and said, oh, I just came fully formed out of the womb thinking everything is wonderful and beautiful about the outside. Like I wanted to showcase that it it wasn't always easy um, and that's okay. It's okay because I, I always turn to the outdoors as a place for safety and as a place where um, I could feel love again, you know, that kind of thing. I was never lonesome outside. I was never ever lonesome outside. It was humans that made me feel lonesome, but not, not um, the outdoors. And my parents modeled that for me. Nobody challenged their expertise in the garden. I saw my neighbors come to my parents for help, you know, in their garden and nobody told my parents go back where you came from. You know, after 9-11, my Republican father had a, a, can, a full can of, of Pepsi thrown at his head from a pickup truck uh, in, a, in a Walmart parking lot and split his head open, you know. Um, and so his response was to put bumper stickers that had the American flag on his car. So, you know, it's complex. I'm, I, I feel like I can't, what my parents had to do to fit in in the 60s is different than what I had to do to fit in in the 80s. And my hope though, and what I, what I have been seeing is that even though the news sometimes is, is full of vitriol and lots of divisiveness, it's not like that for the kids. It's not like that for kids. Kids are so full of love and embracing diversity and other differences. Um, my kids have like a GLBTQ union, you know, that kind of thing for people who, 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 are, who, are, who are not even necessarily GLBTQ, but who are friends of people with um, of different sexualities. And that's something I would never even dream of in, as, a, as a teen in the 80s, you know. Um, so I'm excited for, I think the kids, we have a lot to learn from kids embracing of, of differences than you know, some of the old folks around here. <laughs> you know. Well, I, I think why, one of the reasons your book is so exquisite and, mm -hmm. and poetic is because there is so much anger and violence and bullying, uh, you know, particularly now in our country. And yet you have taken, um, you know, animals and nature to, to help people understand with every one of these essays, there's something, and, and I thought, 
uh, the first time I, I read it a few times now, but the first time I read it, I thought I, I have a new, um, my nephew has a nine month old baby. And I thought, oh, I really must send them this book because in your, you know, in the chapter on the narwhal, on the mm. bus, when, you know, a boy makes you feel different. Mm. And yet instead of, you, you could have written that sort of in typical memoir, you know, all of this could have been much more angry or how I was hurt or whatever, but, but rather you're, you're bringing it, you're bringing it as an example in such, such a beautiful and poetic way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's my, that's my hope is that um, I, I think when we hear rhetoric of like, we're number one, let's make this country great and not help others or, you know, um, let's not give aid to lesser um, people who are in need or who are disadvantaged, not, let's not help them. My hope is that people recognize now that that is a very unnatural way to be. Um, if we look to the plant and the animal world, they realize we're all connected here. We depend on other species for our survival and our, it's, it helps us to help, or, you know, it, it actually helps us when we help each other, you know? So in the plant and animal world, being but alone by yourself is actually super unnatural. And so I want people to realize that when you say like, oh, let's only just make us work on us and nobody else, that it goes against everything that nature is trying to tell right. us. Um, you know, it's, it's very unnatural and gross. Honestly, it's just, it's disgusting. So I'm hoping that um, this appeals to people's shared sense of humanity, that we are so connected that if you can feel tenderness, not just for those yellow birds over there, but get to know the names that they're hooded warblers and they look like they're wearing little ski masks, maybe you'll have less inclination to cut down that whole patch of forest because you know the names of things now. You know that it's not just some birds will lose their nest, but hooded warblers, you know, and maybe you feel a little bit more tender towards them. Maybe you feel a little bit more tender towards this weird looking pink amphibian called the axolotl that you didn't know about. Um, my hope is that if you can be tender towards things you've never seen or experienced, that that tenderness will come out, will also be extended to other people's, other differences, other backgrounds. Um, and let us be tender to each other as, as well. But I did not want to be, this is, you know, I did not want to make this prescriptive. I didn't want to make this finger wagging. You know, they say here in the South, I still feel pretty new to the South, but a saying here that they say in the South is um, you catch more flies with honey. So I just hope that by pointing out what is so good and marvelous about this planet, you also take stock at your own pace, don't do it right now, but at your own pace to say, what are some of the things that I love too about this world? And what do I remember about childhood? Um, you know, walking barefoot in my grandmother's backyard or that first time I was able to climb a tree, you know, and not fall or grabbing an apple off of a tree and being able to eat it because it's not sprayed, you know, that kind of thing. Like if you can just remember those small little details um, about the outdoors, I think, I think you, it's a, it's a very healing and a soothing thing to do, especially now in a pandemic when so many of us are cooped up inside. I'm not a scientist, but I know that like, even just be, it's physically uh, proven that even just being outside with the green light from trees, it actually lowers your blood pressure. It's, not, it's, a, it's medicine, it's actual medicine. So this isn't me just saying, I'm a, you know, the fanciful poet from Mississippi is saying, go outside, la la la. No, it's actually medicine for you and it's free. If you have a tree nearby, you know, um, uh, so many kids nowadays are attached to a screen, attached to a phone, have the headbuds on. I'm not against social media, I'm not against screens, but I think people are forgetting what it's like to be astonished and then to tell about it. And so hopefully this just serves as a reminder for that. And that's what Randall's Island does for those of us who are New Yorkers, because mm -hmm. you know, you're right next to the water and, and there's bees and all cut bridges. And, uh, take advantage of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do. We do. And you must come and visit when you, mm -hmm. when you're in New York. Well, I know Amy has another, um, 
event this evening. So if anyone would like to ask a question, um, perhaps you can put it in the, in the chat before she needs to leave. Um, and I always say no question is too big, too small. Um, I'm happy to field questions. This is kind of, normally I'd stay and chat with you much longer, but um, between Earth Day and National Poetry Month, um, my my Zoom calendar is-, is, is Well, that's why we were so excited when, when we got you for Earth Day, particularly. So yeah. anyway, um, what are you working on now? Oh, thank you. You know, I um, I feel a little superstitious giving any specific details because I'm so close to being done, but um, I'm writing um, for children and um, I'm excited about that. What I can say is I'm writing um, a story in verse. So, um, but it's a whole new world for me. I mean, I, poetry is is not the new world, but writing for children is is it's a whole nother ball game and it's very difficult. It's like writing essays, right? I mean, you had been writing poetry and then you, I mean, this is your only book published yeah. in your essays, so. Sure, yeah, uh, but I'm always writing new poems. Poems are always coming, um, but it's, uh, I'm turning to the world of, of children's writing. My goal was to, to have a book before my kids turn 18. So um, I've got about five more years left, um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, so that, that's what's new. And we're just finishing up here um, uh, for the semester here at University of Mississippi. Um, so one of my greatest privileges of my life is, is directing graduate um, theses, great, um, their own. I'm helping students write their own master's theses on poetry. So a collection of 60 to 70 pages worth of poems. And they're all graduating next week. And I feel so bittersweet sweet about it. You know, I've, I've recruited and and brought these students to Mississippi and their last year was in a pandemic so I'm saying goodbye to them on zoom you know um next week so that that's been um on the horizon too well, we do have one question Amy and I think you just about have time for one question someone's asking about how you had control over the photo uh, over the illustrations in the book because usually you know of course usually with a book when there's a, you know the illustrator's Brought yes. in, you know, not selected by the by the writer or the author necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I appreciate the question so much, and I know exactly what you mean. You know, I've been publishing books for twenty years, and I think this is extremely rare. I will just give a shout out to my publishers, Milkweed um, Editions, who, who also published Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, the, the author I mentioned earlier, um, and. Uh, I think they just saw it. You know, I, I will also say, uh, and I want to stay as classy as possible, so I won't name any names. So many editors, when I said, you know, I, my, my pitch to them was like, these are very short nature essays um, that's, that don't shy away from mentioning that I have brown skin, um, which shouldn't be a novelty, but uh, you'd be surprised how many people were scared away by that. And also there was no at least major trauma. Nobody in my family is addicted to anything. There was no immediate deaths. Uh, many editors were looking for that trauma. And many of them said, we can't sell joy. We can't sell happiness. I and uh, I was so perplexed I about that. Want the, the memoir yeah, that's got <laughs> unzip. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so I think that's really unfortunate. And um, I give so much props to Milkweed because it's a weird um, proposal. And I said, oh, and by the way, I also would like there to be illustrations as an homage to those science books that I, you know, that I read from, from that time period, but also if at all possible, and I said it as politely as I can, I wasn't pulling some diva move. I really would like this to be an Asian American illustrator if possible. And I said, just straight out, when is the last time you saw a nature writing book featuring an, an, uh, an Asian American illustrator? And the answer is we could not find one. We simply could not find one. Um, and in the publishing world, there's so many, the, one of the questions is like, what is your comps? What, is the, what are the books that are like yours so that we have an idea of how to sell this or how to market it? That was the question I had the hardest with. There was nothing like, what I want, what I wanted, what, what what my vision was. And I think it's really unfortunate for especially writers of color because you're asking us to say, oh, I want to be the next Thoreau. 
who likes <laughs> 80s music? No, that's not what I want. Um, or you want me to be the next uh, Annie Dillard or all, all these people that are not what I want to be. I want to be singular. I definitely have influences, but the project I wanted to do was, was like nothing like it. And for some editors, that was a pass because I couldn't say I wanted this to be the next X, Y, Z, you know? So again, um, again, trying to stay as classy as possible. When we got that magical phone call from the New York Times that we debuted on the, I mean, this should never have happened. I'm just a, you know, a poet from, from Chicago, poet from Ohio, poet from Arizona, someone who's used to being a tiny fish in a deep, deep sea. That the New York Times said that not only did I that World of Wonders made it, but we're going to debut at number five and stay on for eight weeks. This is when both Obamas were on the, the list. I think Matthew McConaughey and then me. <laughs> it's like, what? I don't even understand. I say that not as a humble brag. I say that as uh, um, gratitude to an editor and whole editing team and whole, um, when I say publicity, there's two young women who were helping me with this and, and me, we are the publicity team. There's no like departments, that kind of thing. Um, I say this all for gratitude that they believed in my vision. They didn't ask me to change. They said, this is so unusual and we're gonna put our full support by it because we've never seen anything like this. And let's just try, let's just try. And I think the payoff, um, I mean, you have the payoff in your hands. So I've just been so, because uh, again, this should not be a rare thing. This should be something that all editors are looking for something that is unusual, something that is different, because why would we want to read the same book over and over again, especially for voices who haven't normally been heard um, in that genre? You know, why would you want that person to replicate John Muir, someone who was living two centuries ago. <laughs> Why on earth would that be something that you want to happen, you know? So anyway, props to Milkweed. It's an independent press. It was also the only independent press that was on the New York Times bestseller list for that, you know, and during that time. This also too, I will say is happening. Amazon was out of my book from Black Friday till I think maybe March. So this is the power of independent bookstores too, who told their friend and their friend and their friend and their friend. And and, oh, and Barnes and Noble for sure. I don't want to discount Barnes and Noble, but um, I'm just so proud that those editors who passed on this because there was too much joy, um, you know, I just, I, I just, instead of being smarmy, I just want to say thank you to the people, to the editors and to the educators out there uh, and to the teachers who have been um, teaching this book to high schools and to colleges as well. They're, they have been such heroes during the pandemic. Um, nobody who published in 2020 expected to have any sort of a, any make any waves whatsoever. And this is to the power of readers. This is the power of teachers and librarians. Um, who are just advocating for what they love. So it must have a teacher's guide. I haven't even looked. At it does. It. Um, on, the, uh, on the Milkweed website, there's a teacher's guide there. Um, and it, I, I'd like to say it kind of teaches itself because what happens is, is you know, from middle school to, um, you, know, eight, you know, 98, it simply asks the question, when is the last time you felt wonder? What makes you astonished in the outdoors. Everybody has an answer to that question. You don't need a whole lot of money to answer that question. You just need to, to slow down a little bit, to slow down and take notice. And that's free to do. Well, Amy, thank you for your astonishing conversation. It's just wonderful. And, and I do hope that, um, you know, when people are traveling again and you come to New York, we would love to have you on Randall's Island. We'd love to give you a tour and invite Thank you to watch. I will take you up on that. I'm so ready to travel and I love being at home, but I'm so sad that I'm not on the island with you all. And thank you for reading so close and seeing me and hearing, hearing what I have to say. And um, I just, I feel so hopeful for the future because, um, not, not just books like the, 
world of wonders, but the, there's so many readers out there. You know, there's so many, we just came from a time when I think ignorance was championed um, and curiosity was viewed as, as something to be suspicious of. And I just thank you all for being, for just opening yourselves up to being curious, opening yourselves up to astonishment. So thank you all so much, Randall's Island. Um, uh, I hope to see you all soon in person. Thank you, Amy. It was really lovely. Thanks all. Take care. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye -bye. Nikki, you, you, thank you, Amy. Nikki, would you like to say anything about what's coming up in Randall's Island? Yes. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so yes, we have lots with the with the weather warming, unlike today. Um, we have a lot on, on our, for programming going forward. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a flavor, um, we have, well, yoga has already started and will be on the island on Tuesday evenings. Um, our, one of our larger programs will be our uh, celebration for cherry blossoms, which is coming up the first weekend in May. Um, and the day before is Arbor Day. So we are planting trees on the island and celebrating trees. Um, and then we have tours and um, you know, children's programs and volunteering on the farm and in the gardens and with natural areas. Um, we have uh, a city nature challenge coming up the same weekend as Cherry Blossom. So if you'd like to come out and learn how to use iNaturalist or if you know how to use it and, and spend some time on the island with that, our natural areas team will be out there to be able to guide you. Um, so again, check our website. Um, we have, again, a lot coming up and we are planning more and more as the weather gets warmer. Um, we have lots to do outside so we can stay socially distanced and safe. Um, and we would just love to see you on the island. So please definitely come and visit us. Uh, and lots, there's lots in bloom already too. The cherry blossoms and the redbud trees are phenomenal. So come out and see us. So thank, thank you all for tonight thank very you. much. Yes, and just, and also, so we, we are gonna be doing some other things over the summer that have to do with the, the liter, uh, literary program. So please check our website. We'll be posting new stuff all the time. And um, if anyone has any questions, you can always reach us. So thanks. And Elizabeth, thank you very, very much. For this a wonderful very conversation. Very always, absolutely. Thank you. So, everyone be well and, uh, and have a good evening and happy Earth Day again. And National Poetry Month. Too. Yes, National Poetry Month. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, all. Bye. Thank you.